I have made a choice to actually not speak in my natural language Swedish, but rather in English. Is there anybody that opposed to that? I can't speak Swedish, obviously, but I think my experience normally when I travel in Denmark is that sometimes people just look at me and don't really get my Swedish. So I think it's easy with English. Does everybody agree with that? So then we continue with that. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's a great opportunity for me personally. Uh, it's nice to be here at such an important meeting with so many people and have the chance to uh, give you a glimpse of uh, what is happening in the packaging area, the trends and, and, and what packaging actually can do to help our way towards a sustainable community. That's the target for every one of us today, isn't it? And packaging has an important role to play there. And I'll come back to that later. Did you want a presentation of myself? Oh, no. Yeah. Well, I, my background is packaging, obviously. I've been in the packaging business since somewhere in the mid-80s. I started in the food industry, so I have some experience from what we actually do pack as well. Uh, but packaging was the key part of my career for like 30 years now. And uh, I've been out in some uh, different parts of, of, of the world, working internationally almost all the time, actually, with the Swedish international packaging company called Akkelen & Rousing, you know, the inventor of Tetra Pak. And uh, we uh, had the chance, my wife and myself, to move out and be working from Belgium, from England, from Switzerland for a few years. And then we have been coming back to Sweden, starting up a packaging cluster with 200 plus members called Packbridge. And uh, after that, now we're working with uh, consultancy in, in many parts of, of uh, Europe, but also in Southeast Asia a lot, and India, not least. So that's a little bit of my background. Uh, packaging has been around us all the time since human beings started to be active on the world. Uh, and even before that, there was packaging in the nature. Uh, but in the very beginning, the early stage, we were using what the nature could give us. And that was like leaves, bark, seed cases, animal skins, etc. To help us keep food safe. Uh, today, we are in a different situation. We have had some revolutions in the way we use packaging. One of them was, at least I was part of that. I can look around and I don't think too many of you actually experienced the revolution we had in the 50s when the self-service shops came into business and that made a big change from, from a packaging perspective. When everything on the shelves should sell itself and actually be able to brought, bring home in, in, in reasonable portions to use. So that was a big revolution. Today the situation is quite different and we have a way of living that demands more of convenience foods, more of on the good snacks and as we heard here in the beginning of, uh, from Netto, I mean Danes and not just Danes are snacking all the time. We use food in different ways. <laughs> One of the backsides is this. This is how it very often looks. We are pretty good in our part of the world to keep tidy around us, but not good enough. The worst cases are in areas like India, like China, like Indonesia and parts of Africa, where there is plastic all around, in the trees and in, in the seasides. And we see that also here. And actually the plastic debate now in the papers is, is becoming increasingly severe, and not just as a debate, it's actually now parts of legislations in many countries that you prohibit use of single-use plastic, like plastic bags, but also Things like tops, what was it more? Different kind of small stuff that is very usual when we look around what is actually this waste containing on the beaches of our country. We're talking about 8 billion tons, it doesn't say too much, but 8 billion tons, the majority of that is coming from 10 rivers in the world. 10 rivers, where 8 of them is in Asia, one in India and the rest in China, two in Africa. So these rivers, are giving us this huge amount of waste which is floating around in the seas. And, and you have all read in the papers about this big, six big areas globally where there is tons and tons of waste is floating around. The biggest one is in the North Atlantic between Hawaii and the United States. Uh, sorry, Northern Ocean of uh, Stila Hovet. What's that in English? <laughs> you know where I mean. There is the biggest one and that size is twice the uh, sorry, four times the area of Sweden. I don't know how many times that is the area of Denmark, but four times the area of Sweden, we have plastic floating around. So that is something we have to take care of. But all, most of all, we need to take care of the way we do handle plastic right now, so we don't let out more of this stuff. So plastic is a huge problem. 
On the other hand, we also know that food waste is a huge problem. You were addressing that earlier, that you were reducing your food waste, but the most part of the food waste is actually ourselves at home. Sorry. Uh, I did something funny. Yeah. Ah, you can help me on track there, maybe. So that's where one, most part of the food actually disappears. That's when we bring it home and we throw it away because it's got too old. We don't maybe keep our storage in the refrigerators and shelves so good. We let things be there until it's too old to consume. And sometimes the packaging actually hasn't been good enough to protect the food. Well, we're on track. Thank you. Uh, being able, good enough to, to keep our food fresh until we consume it. So that's where packaging can have a tremendous role to prevent food waste and also to reduce it. Nature has done a lot of good product development, we have to say. Uh, nuts, eggs and fruits, banana case, it's quite a good package. Easy to open, rather easy to open, if you open it in the right eye, and <laughs> which we, we normally don't do. So you should actually uh, see banana is one, one of these good examples where you have the, the openability and also being able to tell us when the product is perfect to eat. But you can't actually, it's hard to reclose, that's one issue. You can't eat half of it and then put it in the pocket. And it, doesn't, it isn't able to be stored for a very long time. So the development that human being has been contributing with over years has been helping us to be able to produce, distribute and store food in a more efficient way. And the way we do that in packaging area is that we build up packaging structures, which is, well, it could be plastic, it could be paper-based, it could be anything. But you have the functional layers of being able to seal it hermetically, so it's, it's tight, and you have the functional thing of keeping the right products inside which normally can be aroma or moisture, etc., but also keeping it outside. Oxygen, for example, you want to keep it outside, otherwise the food gets deteriorated faster. So having the right barrier for the different types of food is something that packaging can do. And also you need a surface to be able to carry a label or a print and also be able to be scratch resistant and, and, and keep it whole over the distribution time. Obviously, there is a risk that we do pack too much there is a risk that we overpack things. And when we overpack things, we are creating waste. This curve shows us to the right side what happens when we have too much packaging versus the optimal situation, which is in the midline there. But even worse is underpackaging. When we underpackage, the value we destroy by the content that is destroyed is so much higher. So that is the worst thing to happen. So rather than being on the optimal, with the risk of being on the other side, we normally pack a little bit too good when it comes to distribution packs, to be safe that nothing is destroyed because of improper handling somewhere in the chain. But the aim is to get as fast as possible to the left side here and actually being able to reduce the amount of packaging needed with the same purpose of keeping everything okay all the time to consumption at our home. There is a lot of legislation in Europe having or, or driving us in a direction of actually reducing packaging with the purpose of reducing waste in the end. Not to risk creating more waste by having, for example, food destroyed. So where unnecessary packaging occur, and there are some cases where you could claim there is maybe not a necessity to have a package, we should rethink to take it away maybe. But I guess people most normally are economically doing that in, in a way. So the unnecessary packaging is probably there for another reason then, which, not, might, which might not be the, the actual protection part. But for example, to sell a package in a better way. Uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. That's the three steps that we have to look to. Try to reduce what we can, reuse as long as possible, and definitely make packaging recyclable. The material has to be produced in a way that we can make them getting into the cycle again. And that's very obvious in the new regula uh, regulations. This regulation about the packaging waste directive, that came already in 1994. So it's not a new thing. But what's added now is the necessity to make the material recyclable into new materials. Not just bring it back to some kind of storage in a waste land or somewhere. We should use it again. We have to take into consideration that there is a lot of other aspects in the brand owner's way of choosing packaging. 
Protection is obviously number one. If the product is not consumable when it reaches us, it's worthless. But also, it should be attractive. We were talking about attractiveness when we eat, but also the package, as it is the silent salesman in the shop, it needs to be attractive in a way that we actually see it. And that is maybe sometimes in opposition towards what we would like to reach from an environmental perspective. It may be a little bit, maybe sometimes it's unnecessary many colors, unnecessary many effects, and unnecessary big packaging sometimes. So that is something we have to ask ourselves. Is it helpful to help that, or is it more helpful to help consumers get sustainable solutions for the future? So it's, a, it's an on, on a balance. The functionality, that includes actually the functionality all the way from the packaging machines to storage and handling distribution until our kitchen tables and, and freezers where we use it. Not least the last part, being able to access the content for everyone. Inclusive packaging we're talking about, because it's not too easy to open a package to everyone. Try to open the package with one hand. If you have got a, what do you call it, stroke or something, not many packaging can be opened with one hand. The best packaging, do you know which one that is? Which always comes up out on top when it comes to openability. Any guess? Can? can. Beer can? Yeah, it can be opened with one hand, sure. That's your best experience. <laughs> Anyone else? It's actually packaging that is produced a lot by a company in Denmark called Hartmann. It's the egg packaging. Yeah. Normally it protects the eggs very well, and it's recyclable, and it's definitely very easy to open for anyone. So that is always, almost always coming out on top when it comes to easy, openable packaging. Yep, obviously, I was going the wrong other way, I think. Obviously, also, the uh, communicative part is important. That's part of the marketing thing. But it's also important to inform how you should store the products, where it comes from, the content, etc. And last but not least, the sustainable factors of environment. And also to be having an, an, a cost which is giving you the worth that you pay for. So. The plastic challenge, how should we address that? I mean, we do see more and more plastics on the shelves, and that's because plastic is one of the most convenient, reusable, adoptable, and economically viable material we have. And as some professor somewhere said, if we hadn't invented plastics, we would have to invent it now. But sometimes we combine plastics in the way that it makes it hard to recycle. So the key is to get the society to get the possibility to recycle better than we've used before, than we've done before. Because if we don't use plastic at all and substitute it with new materials, analysis show that the weight would increase with some 300%, the energy consumption would increase, and also the carbon dioxide, the climate effect would increase. So we have, most likely, to live with plastics for the future. So what type of plastic should we then have for the future? Well, everybody is talking about bioplastics as the solution. And very few understand the difference between biodegradable plastics and plastics built up by bio-based uh, resources. To have bio-based resources is no question a better way than have fossil-based resources. Fossil-based resources is somehow adding to the carbon dioxide in some part of the chain, and it is supposed to be finished at some point in time. It's an endable resource. So bio-based resources, where we could use today, it's food resources like sugar canes from, uh, from Cuba that pay, uh, is the major contributor to bio-based plastics today. In the future, in Sweden, there is a lot of products in, on the food side, uh, on the f food, <laughs> wood side, the forest side, to actually make plastics from to nature, but from trees rather than from what could be food instead. And that is forecasted to have a great future. Because plastic is very simple, normal plastic. I talk about polyethylene, polypropylene. It's carbon and it's hydrogen in long chains, polymers. And that's exactly what the cell is built up of in any type of growing thing. Not just sugar, but also in the forest. So cellulosa, for example, was the base for the first plastic, cellophane. And going back to nature that way is probably 
what the future will contain more of. Today it's not so much of that yet, but it's growing. Out of the 320 billion tons plastic produced, we talk about some 2 billion, which is made from bioplastics. So, the strategy, which I a little bit touched upon earlier, uh, from a European perspective, is to design packaging that is more easily recycled. And also to have more effective processes to get plastic into these places where you can recycle it. And to increase the quality. That's why we have to rethink the development of plastics. When I started the business, we should go for thinner, lighter material to any price. And we combine different materials, sometimes up to 20 layers in the extreme cases. Maybe it's a good idea still <laughs> that the jury is still out. Maybe it's still a good idea to have low weight and, and, and don't necessarily go for recycling every part of the material. It's still possible to recycle energy. And rather than burning coal or fossil fuel, you can have the plastic do, giving you energy. But the main aim should be to make the materials in a way that they are more easily recyclable as new packaging material. And what European Union had said, and what some states in England and Sweden, that's the case, and I'm not so sure about what you say in Denmark, but we say 2030, any packaging material in plastics should be based on either bio-based material or recycled material. 2030, and that's not so long time. So, getting down to the more concrete things now, and a little bit of the packaging that is close to the area we're talking about when we talk about catering food. Convenience food packaging, and that's driven mostly by the way we live and mostly by the retailers and, and brand owners <coughs> delivering to the retailers. We see more and more of these solutions, uh, plastic solutions, aluminium solutions, and nowadays also some solutions where cotton-based and paper is, is the main part and plastic the smaller part. In the beginning, it was that we, well, at the beginning, when we started to make these type of solutions was aluminium all through, because it should be used in the ovens. And ovens normally had 200 degrees and plus that, and the material should take that. And aluminium foil was a very good material for that. Then there came a drive, and, and also the parallel development of the microwave oven made it possible, but there was a, also a drive to avoid aluminium, but of course it was considered to be a very, uh, very energy-consuming material, and it is. If you don't recycle it, it's a loss of energy. So, plastic was then the key for many years. And today we try to find solutions where we can substitute at least the major part of the plastics and use carbon board instead. And there are some of these solutions already on the market from store rents to build costness, etc. Where you actually also can thermoform the paper, which seems quite incredible. You can actually, with temperature and pressure, you can form it from a flat web. So not into a shape where you mold it, but actually form it. Yep, so this is a very special solution, which is called Multivac, and there you have a whole system approach, where you fill the package, you put the valve on, and you then cook and pasteurize it in microwaves. So you have a very soft treatment of the product, giving it extremely good quality from a texture and food taste point of view, and then in the end you cool it down very quickly. So it's only talking about a, min a couple of minutes in this process, which makes the food splendid. So actually this was introduced by one of the major chefs in Sweden, Katanachi, and the opera cellar seller in Stockholm, and then you have now spread all over the world. They are not dominating the world by any reason, but they are in Japan, they are in America, and they are, have uh, introduced in a lot of countries now in Europe as well. So, uh, the, uh, another way of pack uh, to, to make it convenient and cost effective, cost effective is to actually introduce some kind of change of the atmosphere that we have around us, which normally otherwise would be part and destroy the food quicker. So you substitute the atmosphere with some mixture of gases we have around us, like nitrogen, like carbon dioxide, in different portions to kill the bacteria and not let them grow so quickly. And that can increase storage time and keep the quality in a good way. So that's the new technology. The old one was vacuum, where you took the oxygen away and, and it was able to be stored longer. Modified atmosphere is another way of doing it and it looks fresher than vacuum pack does. And you can do it for meat, you can do it for vegetables and a lot of other stuff. So what would we see in the future? 
probably a lot more of new materials, and I already touched upon that, but also a lot of integrated technology into the packaging. We've been talking a lot about active packaging for some years, and active packaging is already there with oxygen absorbers, nitrogen absorbers, etc. lots of absorbers of things that can otherwise destroy the food quicker. But we will also see a lot more of intelligence into the packaging, traceability, and all this is possible due to more cost-efficient way of adding print on the package. We can actually print the technology today. And, and that makes it possible to add sensors and also other type of different stuff that helps us to judge whether the food is having the quality that is good enough. So a lot more of integrated technology to create value somewhere in the value chain. Best if it comes creating value for us as consumers, but there are also values that we do not necessarily see that can be achieved by adding this kind of new technology in the future. But if you want to actually predict the future, the best way is to be helpful and invent it yourself. Because it's really very hard to say what is in there in five or ten years' time. And this is a way to express it, like Albert Einstein did once. Thank you very much.